Good morning and welcome to the Mr. Maple Show. Today we've got a special video for you today. We've got visiting our nursery, Summer Rain Oaks. Summer, how did you get started into plants? Uh, well, I grew up in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania, which is like a really beautiful area. And I grew up between farm, field, and forest. And my parents were kind of like homestead-ish. I wouldn't say that they were like fully homestead, but we grew up with chickens and goats, a big garden, and a wonderful orchard. My mom had the best gardens on the street and she did it all herself. So I think like that was something that I probably internalized. I knew pretty early on that I, I loved being out in nature. I was like the type of kid who you could not get indoors. I stole my mom's plant books, stole them, absconded with them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the rest is history. That, that's sort of how we all sort of fall into this crazy plant world. It's like sometimes it seems like you're destined to be in plants. Well, my, my dad jokes because you, you asked if I had, like, if that was my real name, the Summer Rain Oaks. And my dad always jokes and he has a good sense of humor. And he goes, you could either been an environmentalist or a porn star. <laughs> not both, but I chose the, uh, the former, not the latter. <laughs> now, if you don't know Summer Rain Oaks, I'm sure you do. She's got a YouTube, a couple different YouTube channels. How can yes. they follow you on YouTube? Yeah, so on YouTube, it's my name, but we call the one channel Plant One On Me, which is more indoor plants, going and see some of more subtropical, tropical varieties out in the wild, conservatory tours houseplant home tours. And then Flock Finger Lakes is our new one, which is about three years old now. And we do, that's where the chat, the, the video that we're gonna be doing with you is going to be featured on. A lot more outdoor gardening, um, homestead type of stuff. So uh, yeah, check those channels out if you have a moment. Now, how did you get into liking and appreciating Japanese maples? From going from indoor plant person to liking some outdoor plants? Yeah, well actually my background is in ecology, environmental science, and entomology. So I grew up with outdoor plants, but never Japanese maples. It was not something that we had in our landscape. But uh, three years ago, my friends and I got together and we were looking for a piece of land that we could co-live on. And lo and behold, I found something kind of at the last minute of the last hour before I was heading back to my, um, my old home in, in Brooklyn. And I found this place that actually used to be an old plant nursery and he specialized in Japanese maples and rare conifers. So there is some of that actually planted within the landscape. And even though I had gone to Japanese gardens and seen tours and appreciate a lot of the, uh, the layout and the design and the thinking that goes behind Japanese gardens, I never really kind of, I wouldn't have, I don't think I would have gravitated towards Japanese uh, maples in my landscape yet they were planted in the landscape and they were quite a veritable size. Some of them we had to take out because there was too deer browsed, but others were just really beautiful. And it made me appreciate that. And because the person who passed away, who we got the land from, um, we wanted to honor him in a way. So we ended up starting a memorial garden and I ended up uh, sourcing some more Japanese maples for the memorial garden for him because I knew that was a plant that he appreciated. And we started to take a look of the Japanese maple leaves, which have that kind of characteristic acer leaf, you know, yeah. in, in a way. And I started to look for other plants, herbaceous varieties that maybe had similar patterning leaves like hookahs, tiarellas, things along those lines that I could mimic that kind of thing to pay homage to the man who had loved plants prior to us. That, that, that's such an awesome story. I mean, it, and I, one, I appreciate you coming in and, you know, filming some stuff here at our channel too and Absolutely. featuring us. And, you know, it was a, we're real excited to have you come to our channel too. And so what we did is we asked Summer to create a collection of her favorite trees she sees here at Mr. Maple. And it's a little limited because <laughs> it's whatever's in leaf right now. We're, yeah, well, some of the, some, one of the ones I picked is not in leaf, but you have to have a little bit of the imagination. So should we go with the first yeah, one? Yeah, so we're going to do her top six Japanese maples mm -hmm. she's seen today at Mr. Maple. And this is no particular order here. Like, yeah. normally we have an order, no particular order for these. But we're going to start out with this one here. Yes. So this is the Tamukayama. And again, this was one that is not in leaf, but I asked for this one because this there's two of these actually planted in our landscape. They have to be about 15, year old, 15 years old now, if not longer than that. And what I really love about this plant, first of all, it's a cascading variety like that has a really crimson red leaf, um, pretty deep uh, dissectum kind of sublobes. And when in the winter, it's 
you know, deciduous, so it drops its leaves. But in the winter, it gets this really beautiful, very white, grayish, kind of like a gray birch bark. And the structure of it is super beautiful. And, uh, you know, it's funny because he had planted it really close to the house. Yeah. I don't think he intentionally planted it, but when you plant it, it's probably like this this height and this shape and this um this width but now it's kind of grown into the house a little bit like but i like it because it's kind of overflowing into the the um, area where we walk and and so i have to kind of clip it back but i just think that it has a four season interest like a lot of japanese maples do so this one was a pick of mine it has such a graceful habit the it's very graceful the it's name fukuyama translates as like hands folded in prayer on a mountain it's kind of like uh and it's like the hands folded prayer in prayer region and the, the mountain. It's a selection by our friends Kobayashi Mumiji in. They introduced this tree over 300 years ago. And it's still such a classic Japanese maple because one, it's a red that holds its color very well. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. tree out in the landscape. But you notice a lot of these trees are in leaf. This one typically outside leaves out two weeks later than many of the other Japanese maple. Which is actually probably pretty good because I'm in a zone five bordering six, and this is protected a, bit, a little bit by my house, but when we had a cold frost this last time, this one was really well protected, and the fact that it leaves out a little bit better is great for people who are maybe in like some uh, you know colder zones. For sure, and the other thing that's excellent about this tree is it's so heat tolerant, so it can handle more sun than many of the other red selections. Great. So it, it puts itself, pushes the zones and the heat tolerance and in the cold tolerance. So yeah. that's an excellent selection with Fantastic. the Mikiyama. Fantastic. And then... This one was actually, I got from Mr. Maple. It's one of the ones that I had ordered online. And this is Acer Palmatum Rhode Island Red. And I was initially looking for a dwarf variety of red, like a maple that had a red leaf that kind of can, that maintains that kind of red color. Because as I had mentioned, the gentleman before us in the landscape had planted a lot of red leaved maples and we kind of took that as a cue to, to continue to plant some of that in the landscape and just to so it looked like it was it had some flow to it and i wanted something smaller because in the memorial garden the, he already had a lot of the large plants and so i was kind of looking for like a sub canopy kind of um uh red maple like a maple that had this kind of red leaf and then i came across this one that rhode island red and i actually happened to um, have a foster chicken that lived with me in brooklyn who was a rhode island red hen oh, awesome. her name was kippy and so i was i was kind of sold also on the the cultivar name so the fact that it was both a dwarf and had the rhode island cultivar name i couldn't help but get this one <laughs> I, I totally get it I, i've got a ton of frogs and axolotls yeah like there was a japanese maple named you know red-eyed tree frog yeah. i'd be all over hey it. you need to you need to do some crosses and like <laughs> make a selection because i could see if a red-eyed tree frog you get one that has that kind of really green color leaf and then that goes red you know that would be kind of a cool name so rhode island red it really is just that excellent little red dwarf for the landscape with a small rounded habit i mean it has that blood good style foliage but stays dense and compact in the landscape excellent for containers a lot of people grow these in containers and it can be exquisite. If you give it some sunlight, you can actually get some like cherry reds in the early spring mm. too with Rhode Island red, nice. which makes that a, a very fun dwarf. Yeah, people are always asking what the leaves, like what the trees are in our landscape because they might be in like the background. We have a blood good. I didn't pick that as one of my top favorites, but like we have a blood good in the background and people are always asking, what's that red tree in the background? What is that red tree in the background? Yeah. Okay, so I went with a, a different color this time. This actually, I picked this one this is, what was this one? A Koto no Ito. So this is a new one for me, even though I think I've heard of this one before, but I haven't retained all the Japanese names. Um, this one I picked because it has this really filigree linear style leaf as it's coming out. I mean, I, I got a red filigree lace and that it kind of reminded me as like this really thin, like wispy kind of whiskery type of leaf as it's coming out. I would imagine you wouldn't have this in any kind of too windy of an area. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, but like, I would be afraid that like some of these uh, leaves would like freeze off. But I thought this was just so elegant and, um, you know, this, it, it looks like whiskers to me. It, it is. It, Kota no Ito, the name means Japanese harp string. And it's because of that sort of thread-like foliage. Mm -hmm. It is what we call a lunar lobum Japanese maple. And it's because of that, that very linear uh, lobes that you're looking at. It is a nice upright, eight to 10 foot in 10 years, yellowish to oranges in the fall. 
we've got a gorgeous specimen of this over at Maple Gardens, not in leaf yet, my parents' home, but when it blows in the wind, I mean, it just adds a unique texture in the landscape. Mm. I mean, you see that thread-like foliage. It's almost just like little wind chimes yeah. just blowing in the wind. Now, when you get a really cold wind, is this something that you think you'd want to have protected or no? Because the red filigree lace, I, I know like some of the um, suggestions is like, don't have it out on like a cold mountaintop, you know, where the ice, like ice could hit the leaves because it doesn't have a lot of leaf. I don't know. Well, this is one that's been fairly hardy for us. Good. Uh, the lunar lobum selections are what we consider an acer aminum. Mm. And that they're typically a little more cold tolerant than your typical just acer palmatum. I got it. Okay. And, uh, so it's in a different category, basically. Yeah. It's like a yeah. different subspecies. Yeah. That's how most people yeah. would consider it in Japanese maples. Okay. And, uh, it's one that, you know, makes a beautiful tree, mid-size upright, fits in a lot of people's landscape, eight to 10 foot in 10 years. Oh, nice. Um, but the texture, the foliage texture yeah. is what draws me into it. I think that's yeah. probably what drew you in even to this Yeah, absolutely. I like, I like diversity and texture of leaves. So I think I, you know, with my favorites, I, I went and picked a number of these. I think you sold me on this one because this is like, uh, we were doing a video that we will release on Flock and uh, you were really like selling this one hard, I guess. <laughs> and this is the Golden Falls. It kind of reminded me of, so I recently just planted a Circus canadensis, which is an Eastern red bud. And they also have one called Golden Falls. So it has a very similar leaf and it has this weeping habit. Um, so I just actually planted that right next to our blood good because I liked that kind of splotch of you know color against the red and then the herbaceous plants all around so oftentimes when i plant i will like take cues from the landscape of what's already there and then i do a lot of like our native perennial plantings underneath with like maybe some of these um, introduced like varieties of plants this one had such a really beautiful habit in the way that you were describing it how it will actually kind of drape on the ground almost like a ground cover and it has this kind of chartreuse bright yellow green leaf with these orange tips as if it was like dipped in like uh, orange watercolor. I thought that was a, a really handsome plant. I, I loved your description of it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, Y'all know I love the color yellow and this weeping habit on Golden Falls makes it extremely special. I mean, it's crazy that our mentor, Talon Buckholz, was introducing this the same time as Dragon Master. Oddly enough, we sent him our golden weeping selection mm -hmm. and he sent his, us his golden weeping selection That's great. so we could sort of compare and contrast and yeah we actually realized they were you know similar but different mm. and golden falls is just such a strong vigorous plant it just adds that yellow color out in the landscape and yellow just increases what you see in the color spectrum and the color green normally if you have a landscape out there and you've got green and then dark green you get lost. You mm. add a yellow in there, and then all of a sudden, you begin to see every shade of green. And that's what that's what draws me to the color yellow, and the fact that it gives such good color contrast with everything else that's out there. I also also with yellow, I found out because I I went and planted a uh, a pollinator garden, and I did a lot of like um, purples and. Uh, like reddish purples and pinks and things along those lines. And then our chipmunk went and planted some sunflowers and all of a sudden these yellow, pops of yellow came up and I was like, ooh, that's kind of what the garden needed is some yellow. And so I went in there and I actually planted some more of our grindelias and like our arnicas, like uh, some of our native, our uh, uh, sneeze weeds and things like that. So I wanted to plant the yellows. The other thing too is I we went and planted a bunch of bulbs within our lawn. It's not Japanese maple related, but similar to what you're saying with yellows. I did not think I would like the Tulipa sylvestris. It's a species tulip that has bright, sunny yellow flowers. And I was like, I didn't think I would like it as much, but when those come out in the sun, it just makes the landscape happier. It really does. So I think that would probably be very, uh, uh, like an analog to something like this I, in the I landscape. Think, I think you couldn't say that even better because sometimes people get lost in putting a red Japanese maple in the landscape and they're beautiful and there's great places for them but the lively feel that a green or a yellow can bring to the landscape mm. just adds a whole new dimension. Mm. So the next one that he's going to um, pick up here is 
it seems like a more upright habit of like the one that I just picked. So I thought that this was a really good display and this is Phoenix. And I thought this was a really good display about how if you didn't have one and you didn't want one that was more like draping, have a, a drapey habit, this one could be a bit more of an upright habit. And it just goes to show you that there's like a Japanese maple for just about any space in any place. Um, as long as you're within that zone five <laughs> through nine, if you're pushing it in some places, but um, but yeah, I thought like this one would be really nice for somebody who didn't want the, you know, that kind of girth of one that is draping on in that area. Now, Phoenix, this is actually an introduction by one of my good friends, Dick Vanderman, who passed away last week. Mm. He was uh, in Holland. He's introduced so many amazing specimens of Japanese maples. Uh, and this is one that's really special to us because of that yeah uh, i'm glad i picked it then it emerges it's a good in the homage for him yeah it, it emerges in the spring mm -hmm. like a phoenix and you can get some coral pinks to some really crazy yellow patterns on these spring interest types how tall do you think this gets at 10 years uh about eight feet okay and uh it really puts on a show of color uh definitely a, a plant that you know we were good friends with dick vandermatt he We've got over a thousand cultivars, about 1,500 uh, cultivars of Japanese maples. And when Dick Vandermatt was, we met him in Oregon at a Maple Society meeting, you know, he treated us and gave us respect when Matt and I had a hundred cultivars and were yeah. doing tailgate markets. Yeah. And it meant a lot to us because he was a well-known nurseryman with over a thousand varieties. Well, you got to start somewhere and he probably understood that. Yeah. And yeah. so a lot of his introductions mean a, mean a lot mm -hmm. to us even more now. Um, but uh, a beautiful spring interest tree. I like them because it's almost like having a flowering interest in the garden. Mm. They leaf out in the spring and give you like this flower. The foliage is almost like a flower in the landscape and just grabs your attention, but it's not a bloom, it's the leaves themselves. Yeah, exactly. And then lastly. Last one. This one I just saw and I thought, well, this one is really cool. So this is what Shishi Gashura? Well, Shishi Gashura, yeah, yeah exactly. that's great. I mean, this one I thought was really interesting because of like a slightly wrinkled texture of the leaf when it when it's first coming out. And I really like that. Anything that has like a bullet texture or like wrinkles or rugosa, like something that has that kind of textural element to the leaf, I think could be cool. That early leafing out, I thought that was something that was uh, really eye catching. So this one is actually known for having that ruffled texture. Hmm. And it'll have that ruffled texture even in the fall with like bright orange. Nice. And so it is really adds a unique texture dimension. And it's because of that texture that you see and the fall colors where it gets the name of Shichigashiro, which basically means like lion's head or lion's mane. Because uh, it kind of looks like a lion's head. It kind of sounds like Shishi Kashura. Sounds like a really like high maintenance woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I love about this plant is it's very hardy. Yeah. So it's good in cold zones. It's a slow grower, but it also does really well in those high heat settings. Mm. And so if someone's in a hotter zone, this is one that can actually typically handle more sun than many other Japanese maples. And it performs really well out in the landscape. And it's just a beautiful tree. I mean, we're talking six foot in 10 years. But that tuft appearance just adds a unique texture. And you think of Japanese maples and with everything we've got, we've got over a thousand varieties of Japanese maples here. There's so many different textures and so many different colors. You can play off of textures, you can play off of spring colors, you can right. play off of fall colors. Right. And so there's so many things you can do with all these trees. Yeah, well, thank you so much. This is, I've learned a lot in this whole tour and even the additional elements that you just shared here. So I appreciate it and I hope you liked all the selections that I've picked, but obviously, as he said, there's like 1500 here. So you got to keep pulling and showing, <laughs> showing all the plants. Well, Summer Rain, thank you so much You're for welcome. Uh, coming today and filming. Thanks for jumping on our channel as yeah, well. Absolutely. Go follow her channel, Summer Rain Oaks. You got to check that out. She's got a lot of different things going on from the indoor house plants to her homesteading. Just check out both of those. And guys, make sure to hit this like button, share this with your gardening friends. And always remember to make sure you're subscribed here on MrMaple.com. Take care, God bless, and have a great day. Bye.